Thanks for joining us for KSAT News at 9, streaming from here in the KSAT 12 newsroom. I'm Steve Spreister. Coming up, another round of businesses have reopened across the state. We're heading to Del Rio to learn more about what the border town's COVID-19 response is like. Plus, we're fact checking some of the most popular but completely untrue claims of the past week. But first, two more COVID-19 related deaths reported in Bear County tonight, bringing the death toll to 56. There are now 1,835 total confirmed cases in Bear County, 24 from in the community, two from the Bear County Jail. And earlier today, more businesses began reopening across the state of Texas. It's part of Governor Greg Abbott's second phase in his plans to restart the economy. San Antonio Mayor Ron Nuremberg says he's happy businesses are reopening, but he wants to make sure they are doing so in a safe way. He says there have already been issues with businesses not following the proper protocol. They're threatening every other business uh, out there because we might be put in a position where we're having to roll that back. And it's not just here uh, locally. The governor has made it very clear mm -hmm. if there are localized outbreaks, he's going to send in the state to help us enforce that. Among the businesses reopening across the state, barber shops, hair salons, and in New Braunfels, river parks. In just a few minutes, we're going to hear how those parks are working to keep customers safe. It has been nearly two months since the first COVID-19 case was reported here in Bear County. Let's take a look at how the situation has played out since March 13th. In that first month, we went from one case to 794. On April 19th, we crossed the 1,000 case threshold. We started out this month with just over 1400 cases and tonight again we are at 1835 confirmed cases. Here's a look at the status of Bear County's cases as of tonight. 46% are still battling the virus, 3% have died, 51%, 852 people have recovered. From San Antonio to the border city of Del Rio, COVID-19 has left very few places unaffected. The mayor of Del Rio says some people did not believe the coronavirus would actually hit the small city. It did. Tiffany Huertas has a look at that city's response. We have had to let go of um, actually a lot of employees here, and that's something that, you know, is really hard. Like businesses across the nation, the general manager of this restaurant in Del Rio says they are adjusting during the pandemic. We have opened up to dining 25% now. Liliana Echavaria says besides the occupancy cap, they have made changes at the restaurant. Menus are now disposable and there are hand sanitizing stations throughout. We have separated all the tables six feet apart. We disinfect every time they come and they leave. 49,000 people live in Valverde County. As of today, 495 have been tested for COVID-19. 13 have tested positive. People were like, it's not going to happen in Del Rio. We're so isolated, we're small, but then you realize it's hitting communities left and right. Throughout the pandemic, the city has been communicating with local and state agencies. So we host a, a weekly local emergency planning committee, community COVID preparedness uh, meeting and we have over 100 participants on that. The city has set up a COVID-19 community hotline where people can call with any questions regarding the coronavirus. While the pandemic has changed everyone's life, Liliana is staying optimistic. I'm really excited and glad that we're slowly, slowly getting back. For The Nine, Tiffany Huertas. And meanwhile, the only hospital in Del Rio has been testing patients and taking extra measures to keep everyone safe. They're also keeping a close eye on their medical equipment supply. That hospital has six available ventilators. None are in use currently. Besides Valverde's 49,000 residents, the hospital also sees patients from surrounding counties. Valverde Regional Medical Center CEO Linda Walker says every day they have a call with officials from the city, county, and Laughlin Air Force Base. We do an update and we talk about our, our PPE. We talk about um, our supplies, how many days hand on plot, on, days on hand we have of gloves, masks, shields, um, any issues uh, we've had at our screenings for patients and for our employees. We're not seeing the volume in, in cases that you're seeing in the metropolitan areas. I mean, we're pretty remote out here. We feel very fortunate that we've only had 11 cases, but we've responded as if we were um, going to have a surge. 
She says patients are screened at the front door of the hospital. In the emergency room, if someone presents symptoms of COVID-19, they are taken to a negative pressure room and tested. Of the 13 people with confirmed cases in Del Rio, 12 have already recovered. Test results for another 23 people are pending, and as of today, there have been no COVID-19 related deaths in Del Rio. Back here in our area, River Parks and New Braunfels reopening this weekend, but with new restrictions. Park goers must maintain social distance while out along the Comal River. As of today, only the Prince Psalms Park, Hinman Island and the city's tube chute are open, but with limited hours of operation. River Outfitters also required to follow Governor Greg Abbott's guidelines to continue operating. New Braunfels Mayor Baron Castile says he's aware that businesses along the river have been impacted. Their plan is to get back to everyday life in the safest way possible. And we are trying our best to tr bring back some sense of normalcy, but within the guidelines that the governor is, re is requiring of our businesses as well as our municipalities. River Parks will be open from 9 in the morning until 8 o'clock at night each day. More parks along the Guadalupe River are expected to open tomorrow. Let's turn to tonight. Tonight at 9, three children found in critical condition severely malnourished in a Wilson County home. Spanish police arrest a man they say is an ISIS follower, plus a look at how COVID-19 is impacting communities around the world. Here's tonight's 9 at 9. In Georgia, a father and his adult son have been arrested in the murder of Ahmad Arbery, a young black man who was shot and killed while jogging in February. Gregory and Travis McMichael charged with murder and aggravated assault. The shooting happened back in February, but no charges were filed at the time. The men claimed they believed Arbery committed crimes in the neighborhood. Today would have been Arbery's 26th birthday. Investigators say the men were arrested at about 745 Thursday evening and taken to jail. They say the investigation continues. They will include everyone involved. They have not ruled out the idea of more arrests. Three children ages four to 16 months are recovering at a San Antonio hospital after being removed from a home in rural Wilson County earlier this week. Investigators say a young girl texted 911 about a possible child abuse case on Tuesday. That message led deputies to this house along State Highway 123 near Stockdale. Inside, according to court records, they found floors covered in trash, feces, and urine. All three kids showed signs of physical abuse and malnourishment. Investigators said today their case is focused on the children's maternal grandmother. She has not been formally charged or arrested. A Southwest Airlines jetliner hits and kills someone while landing at Austin Bergstrom International Airport last night. The pilot maneuvered to avoid hitting a person on the runway, but shortly after the plane touched down, the person was found dead. An airport spokesperson says they do not believe the person was supposed to be on the runway at that time. A pregnant mother in California who was found stabbed outside of a church has been released from the hospital. According to police and family members, the woman was with her one-year-old daughter earlier this week, was at the church to meet her husband, and they got into a fight. He was being combative. He attacked her and uh, had tried to stab her several times in the stomach and the throat and uh, she fought him off and tried to protect herself. The police say the man took off with their one-year-old daughter and threw her over a steep cliff. She did not survive. The man is facing a charge of murder. The woman and her unborn baby are expected to be okay. Spanish police have arrested a Moroccan man on suspicion of planning a terrorist attack in Barcelona. Police say the man is an ISIS follower who repeatedly violated the country's coronavirus lockdown to possibly scout locations for an attack. The U.S. Postmaster General is saying the coronavirus pandemic could have, quote, potentially dire consequences, end quote, for the Postal Service. Business started to take a hit in March. It's only gotten worse since then. In a press release today, the USPS warned that the trend could threaten its survival. The amount of mail is plummeting and it's losing more and more money. The Postmaster General is calling on Congress and the Trump administration to help shore up its finances. The mayor of Milan reacted angrily to images of people gathered in parks and restaurants not exercising proper social distancing. According to the latest government guidelines, gatherings are prohibited and people are supposed to maintain a one meter distance from others. The soccer season has officially kicked off in South Korea. K-League matches have been postponed because of the coronavirus. On Friday, the pitch came back to life once again. The stands, though, were empty as the games are being played without any spectators. 
The UK has released the last decoded Nazi message from World War II, marking the 75th anniversary of Victory in Europe Day. The British government released this goodbye message from a German lieutenant set out on May 7, 1945. He sent it just before surrendering to British forces on Germany's northern coast. In the message, he noted British troops had entered the area and he wished his colleagues, quote, all the best, end quote. To read more about these stories, head to ksat.com. Good evening, I'm meteorologist Katie Blake. We had another cold front move through today and it definitely didn't get cold behind this front, but you probably noticed the wind. Winds have been quite gusty this afternoon and this evening. Thankfully, those winds will start to relax overnight. And while it'll stay a touch on the breezy side tonight, by tomorrow afternoon, those winds will become light and that's gonna play a part in why the upcoming weekend is just going to be so enjoyable weather-wise. It won't be until middle part of next week that the heat and humidity really starts to creep back in. So really soaking in the next couple of days. Let's talk about those winds that have been so gusty at times today. They're out of the north behind today's cold front and through midnight wind speeds will stay about 10 to 20 miles per hour where they are right now. As we get into the pre-dawn hours of Saturday morning, get closer to dawn, wind speeds could still be on the breezy side 10 to 15 miles per hour, but by lunchtime tomorrow they'll be starting to become light 5 to 10 and then that's where they'll stay for the rest of your Saturday and also on Sunday. So if the wind kind of bugged you today, it won't be so bad this weekend. Saturday, more cloud cover, a high temperature in the low 80s. We'll also be in the low 80s on Sunday, but there will be more sunshine. So if I had to pick a better day for you, it would maybe be Sunday for Mother's Day because we'll just have a bit more in the way of cloud cover around on Saturday. A reason why we'll keep more clouds around on Saturday as compared to Sunday, there's a weak piece of upper level energy moving in from Mexico. However, a lot of this is going to miss us well to the south. So that's gonna keep a good chance of rain down in deep, South Texas in the Rio Grande Valley tonight into the start of the day on Saturday. So some showers possible well to our south. However, I just don't anticipate any rain making it to San Antonio uh, over the course of the day on Saturday. As that upper level low starts to move off to the east Saturday night, that'll take the cloud cover with it. So that's why skies will be starting to clear out by late Saturday. And we're looking at a mostly sunny day on Sunday. If you need to get the car washed this weekend is a good time to do it. Things are looking good Saturday into Sunday. Now by Monday, if you get to Monday and you haven't washed the car yet, I would maybe think about holding off because our next decent chance of rain for San Antonio comes Tuesday of next week. Another disturbance moving through looks to spark some scattered showers and thunderstorms. So if you wash it tomorrow or Sunday, you should be good to go. On Monday though, I would hold off because of that chance of scattered storms on Tuesday. Tuesday is also when you'll really start to notice the humidity once again, and it looks like things will be staying hot and muggy through the end of next work week. Have a great weekend. And coming up, we're going to talk to the head of SAWS about the coronavirus crisis. We'll be back in one minute. Until this crisis is over, every weeknight we are trying to separate the facts from the fiction surrounding the new coronavirus. Tonight we are joined by the president and CEO of the San Antonio Water System, Mr. Robert Puente. Robert, thank you for joining us tonight. And there's breaking news that just came in uh, earlier this evening from Houston that they are testing their wastewater for COVID-19. What exactly does that mean? Well, every, all indications are that this virus cannot uh, transmit itself through wastewater. In other words, you don't have to worry about that. The reason some utilities are taste, uh, testing their wastewater streams is to see and predict if there's a hot spot somewhere or if there's actually a decrease in the amount of people having it in what used to be a hot spot. Yeah, so it's not a concern necessarily about drinking water. It's just to kind of follow where it is and, and how they can combat it. Correct. It's it's a tool that they use to, to see where there might be a hot spot. Any interest in saws in doing something like this? Uh, not yet. Uh, you know, just by the mere numbers, we know where those hot spots are. The um, the uh, nursing home on the southeast side and the jail, of course, are the two big hot spots. But we haven't really talked about using this as a tool yet. 
great. All right, let's get to some of our questions that we have for tonight. What has SAWS been doing to provide services during this public health crisis? And I know that people don't uh, uh, think of utilities as essential services, but your workers really are. Uh, they are, and you know, we we're all proud of the of the medical field, the nurses, the first responders. I'm just as proud as of our individuals that are out there. Um, putting themselves and their families at risk also because they have to respond to line breaks, they have to respond to sewer spills, they have to make sure that we still continue to oversee the construction that's going on. So we've had to uh, kind of adjust to what, to what they are. Uh, we know that for the longest time restaurants were closed and so we had to find a way to feed our employees that were out in the field. And we did certain things like that to make sure that our employees always felt that they could do their job and still be protected. So if it was from taking their temperature uh, to um, minimizing their contact, in other, in other words, not more than one individual per vehicle, uh, we did all of those things to make sure that they were protected. All right, I want to get to our first viewer question tonight. Has there been an increase in demand with more people staying home? Have you noticed anything about that on those lines? Um, no, uh, our utility is still very much weather dependent. Uh, whether it's an increase or decrease, it hasn't really been much other than the weather itself. We have seen a bit of a decrease commercial and a bit of an increase a residential. They offset each other somewhat, but nothing of big uh, substance that you can really tell there's something else going on besides the weather. All right, next question. Is there help out there for those who can't pay their water bills right now? Uh, there's a tremendous amount of help. Of course, the federal government issued that stimulus check. The city of San Antonio just received $270 million from the federal government to be spent on COVID-related uh, necessities. Part of that, we hope, is utility assistance. Uh, from the very beginning, we have told our customers, if, you're, if you've lost your job, uh, your spouse lost a job, or there's been a cut in pay, don't worry, your bill, your water services will not be cut off. So we have discontinued that program of going out and cutting people's water off if they're not paying their bills. So that's the big, big help that we can do for them. At the end of this, whenever we get back to some normalcy, we have to figure out a way how to collect that bad debt. But we're going to do a lot of communication with the customer. We're going to let them know what programs are available to hopefully help them pay off that, that, uh, that bill. Uh, everything from us being much more flexible, for example, not charging late fees and give them, give them opportunities to make a much longer payment plan if that's what we need. Yeah, one less thing to worry about with all these other things going on. Uh, yeah. Yes. I, I, we'd be remiss if we didn't talk about Vista Ridge since we have you on tonight. It's a new water source for San Antonio. It's come online. Looking back, would you do this entire process again? Uh, Steve, looking back, I wish our community had done it the way we chose to do it this go around. If you go back all the way to the 1960s, we have been trying to get a, wa a new water supply to diversify off of the Edwards decade after decade after decade. And we saw failure after failure after failure, spending millions of dollars going after these projects. Lawsuits developed. Uh, we couldn't get the permits. So you literally had saw us spending tens of millions of dollars and not a single drop of water. So we needed to do something entirely different this go around. And what we did is we shifted the risk over to the private sector, told them you build the project, you get the permits, you get the rights of way, you construct it, you get the financing, you do everything. All saws will do is buy the water when it gets here. Therefore, they took all of that risk. And yes, the water is, is more expensive than any water that you'll probably see here in Texas today. But the price of that water today is the same price that will be in 30 years. Think of anything, Steve, that is essential as water where the price does not increase for a full 30 years. Not only that, in year 31, the price actually drops because all of the financing, all of the infrastructure will have, be paid, will have been paid for. It all reverts back to SAWS. And the, then all we do is pay for the price of water at a reduced rate. So this is a great project in two 30 year uh, contracts that will take care of our water security for the next 60 years. And live during six o'clock, I took a sample of the Vista Ridge right from the pipeline. Tasted great. So with that in mind, we're in drinking water week. 
What is Drinking Water Week? It's an attempt by the industry to let people know how important water is and how really we all need to understand what it takes to get that water to your tap. To some extent, it's not something that our customers should worry about. Uh, we always want them to know and recognize that water, as soon as you turn that faucet on, plentiful, clean, pure water will come out of it. Don't worry about it. But we also want to be recognized. We want our employees to be recognized for the tremendous amount of work. Steve, you simply saying that that water takes great sends a chill of respect uh, to, our, to our employees, uh, sends out messages to our employees that for the last um, 10 years, what they have been doing came to fruition, that we actually had uh, this project online on board and it tastes good. Yeah, it tastes better than good. It tastes really great. All right, uh, final question for you. What have you learned in this process? I think what we've learned, um, at least especially me, is that so much of what we're doing can be done remotely. It, it's not going to be to where all of our employees are going to be working from home. I would be um, lying if I said that we have not skipped a beat. There's a lot of things that we do better when we're uh, with each other, when we're talking to each other about the circumstances. But for example, our call center, um, some of the individuals that are working from home, they took their laptop home. They have access to the complete records at stalls of any customer, whoever may call. So I've tasked all of our departments to really look and see whether or not this is something that can be sustained to some extent. Interesting. Robert Puente, the president and CEO of the San Antonio Water System. Appreciate your time tonight. Have a great weekend. Thank you, Steve. We'll be right back. Turning to tonight's top stories, the U.S. economy lost a record 20.5 million jobs last month. That makes April the largest single month of job losses since the Bureau of Labor Statistics began tracking that data in 1939. The unemployment rate soared to 14.7 percent in April. The last time American joblessness was that severe was during the Depression. Analysts say job growth could resume by Memorial Day as businesses in many parts of the United States start to reopen. Drought conditions have pushed San Antonio closer to possible water restrictions. The aquifer at the J-17 well is nearing the 660 foot threshold. The Edwards Aquifer Authority, which regulates the aquifer, says pumping restrictions on their end may be only one week to 10 days away. Restrictions require a 10 day rolling average of 660 feet or below. You could be paying more for your meat in the coming weeks. Temporary closures and slowdowns at some meat packing plants across the country causing serious issues in supply chains. At Viatrix Meat Market here in San Antonio, they're actually seeing higher customer demand. And while they're able to process product from area ranches, they also are getting some outside suppliers meet in. They tell us those prices are up to 30 to 40 percent higher. Just because you see something trending online doesn't mean it's accurate. At the end of every week, the Associated Press puts together a roundup of some of the most popular but completely untrue stories and images of the past several days. Let's take a look. Our first claim of the night, Vice President Mike Pence delivered empty boxes of personal protective equipment, or PPE, to a nursing home for a publicity stunt. The claim went viral on social media after Jimmy Kimmel Live aired a selectively edited clip of Pence joking about carrying empty boxes for the camera. But the full clip, which was obtained by the Associated Press, confirms that Pence didn't actually deliver empty boxes. Another claim we're fact checking tonight. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention updated its website to reduce the coronavirus death count from 64,000 to 37,000 yesterday. Social media users are suggesting the nation's health protection agency inflated the number of fatalities to make the virus appear worse than it is. Here are the facts, though. The numbers being used in this claim are incomplete. They come from a page on the CDC's website 
that provides provisional death count numbers from coronavirus. The page clearly states the data shown may be incomplete and a couple of weeks behind. All right, one more claim for tonight. Bill Gates, former doctors say the vaccine advocate refused to vaccinate his own children. The social media post quotes an unnamed physician, but the claim is false. Gates wife Melinda Gates debunked the theory in April of 2019 when it first started circulating. She says all three of her children are fully vaccinated. A stabbing at a barber shop sends shockwaves through a northwest side business and Traders Village makes plans to open. RJ Marquez has some of this week's top stories in the week in 210. A man arrested after a deadly attack at a diesel barber shop on the northwest side. Damien Terrell Campbell was arrested Thursday in connection with the stabbing death of an employee. The victim was identified by the medical examiner as 20-year-old Evan O'Regan. Police and friends have referred to her as a transgender woman with the name Heli O'Regan. We weren't doing anything that we weren't supposed to be doing other than making sure that my staff and the clients were going to be safe for when we do reopen. So frustrating and sad and it just, it's just in shock. Police say Campbell also stabbed another employee who ran away and called for help. A funeral procession this week honored fallen Bear County Sheriff's Deputy Timothy De La Fuente. The medical examiner confirmed Tuesday that De La Fuente died last week from COVID-19 complications. Jail officials say he had been assigned to work in a jail hotspot area where many people tested positive for the virus. He wanted to continue working. He was very much into his job, into the community and helping. De La Fuente worked for BCSO for 27 years. Traders Village San Antonio is set to reopen. The city had initially told the flea market they wouldn't be allowed to operate under Texas Governor Greg Abbott's reopen Texas orders. But the change comes after the Texas Division of Emergency Management classified Traders Village as a type of shopping mall. They have to operate at a 25% capacity and there will not be any rides or live music. East Central School officials announced plans for a drive up graduation. Principal Shane McKay says graduates will be in a parade of cars with their own family members inside. After their name is called, graduates will be allowed to drive to a staging area. Our trustees will be handed their diploma uh, after it's been, of course, uh, sanitized and wiped down as per the, the guidelines. The Southwest School District came up with a unique way to honor its seniors. The district is sending a green beam of hope into the sky. The beam will alternate between the district's two high schools through early June, the district says they have received clearance from national and state officials. Hey, what's up guys? Time to check out some stories that are trending tonight on KSAT.com. And we start with a San Antonio floral shop that really kind of thought outside the box to keep their business going. Instead of flowers or bouquets, they have been selling jigsaw puzzles. That's right, this is a pretty cool idea. Floral number nine is the name of the place here in San Antonio. And what they did was that they kind of saw this like booming jigsaw puzzle business. Pretty crazy, all of us are stuck at home. And they just decided that, you know what, let's try and see if we could sell a few puzzles um, and see what they could do. And they sold out within two weeks. Now, the big sort of thing with them is that a lot of their puzzles are San Antonio centric. They have uh, like Pan Dulce puzzles. Day of the Dead puzzles, and all sorts of different like uh, South Texas iconic things. So it's pretty cool. You can check out the story on ksat.com. And uh, I just like the fact that uh, they apparently reached out to their wholesaler, their flower wholesaler, and just somehow got connected with the uh, jigsaw puzzle business. So their puzzle guy is also their flower guy. Pretty cool stuff. So check it out on our website. All right, moving on here. Um, second story of our evening. You know, a lot of people were a little bothered, a little upset that the Thunderbirds flew over some Texas cities this week, Houston especially, um, and they were not flying over San Antonio yet. What was up with that? Well, that wrong has been righted. The Thunderbirds have announced that they are going to fly over Military City on May 12th, so that's going to be Tuesday. 
right now the time for them to fly over the area is uh, 1 20 p.m and it lasts about half an hour so it's going to be pretty interesting to see them uh, they're also going to be stopping in austin after they fly over san antonio now some of this stuff is of course subject to change weather and all that stuff will play a part in it but uh, a lot of people are really excited to see the thunderbirds i am as well i've only seen them once before i was eight years old they scared the heck out of me it was so loud I didn't really get to enjoy that experience, but uh, I'm definitely looking forward to this one. If you want more information on the Thunderbirds flying over San Antonio, head over to our website. And of course, they are doing this um, to honor workers that have really been on the front lines of COVID-19. So great stuff there. All right, last story of our day, and we end this uh, with the kind of the weirdest story of the day. Um, the headline here, beautiful but dangerous blue dragons discovered on the Texas beach. <laughs> So these blue dragons were just spotted in Padre Island over the weekend. No one really knows like where these things came from. They are, uh, they're like a slug-like creature. Um, and they just showed up in Texas Beach. You know, after the murder hornet, I'm thinking like these little creatures are just like, you know what, we're gonna, we're taking over the earth right about now. <laughs> <laughs> but um, these actually are not are not probably as bad as the murder hornets. Um, uh, they were found over the weekend by a family, and then they were actually like put back into the water. Uh, officials there in Padre Island are trying to figure out what they're doing there, how they washed up ashore. Apparently, um, they are the predators of the Portuguese man of war, which is like a jellyfish-like creature. So the blue dragons and the Portuguese man of war go into battle. I love it. So if you want more information on this, go to our website, ksat.com. We have a lot more information on these blue dragons. A lot of people were clicking on this story throughout the day. So uh, that'll do it for our training segment. You guys have a great weekend. You guys stay safe, take care, and I will check in with you guys again later. That does it for the Friday night version of KSAT News at 9. I'm Steve Spreacher for all of us here at KSAT 12. Thanks for watching. In case you were wondering, Stan Smith's. My Friday night shoes. Yeah, there they are. Well, whatever, Patrick. See you at 10.